Uh, Daryl Strong joins us, the owner of Strong Racing and uh, one of the board members for H1 Unlimited Hydro Racing. Daryl, Unlimited Hydroplanes are unlike any other form of motorsport machinery out there. Very, very, very unique piece of racing equipment. Can you talk a little bit? We just heard Tim Seabull talking about what an H1 or what an F1 powerboat is like. What's an H1 Unlimited machine like these days? Um, it's about uh, 6,500 to 7,000 pounds. It's uh, about 3,000 horsepower. It will um, go up to 200 miles an hour on the straights. And uh, uh, sometimes it'll take off like an airplane and flip. <laughs> They, uh, you've used a variety of different power plants over the years. Uh, piston engines out of fighter airplanes were pretty much where the whole sport began. And then now we're on to the turbine engine, the jet engine, basically, basically a rocket ship on the water. What is, how has that evolved over time and where is it at currently? Yeah, and in the mid 80s, they went to a, a turbine engine and then they settled somewhere in that period of time into a uniform one. It's a Lycoming um, T55 um, a turbine jet engine out of a helicopter. So they're, uh, they're from the Vietnam era. And um, um, there is one piston boat still running, which is a, a V12 from a World War II airplane. And then there's vintage boats that run but almost all the current boats would use this uh, turbine jet engine. When you look at an H1 Unlimited Hydro and you think about what it's going to do, on paper, it makes absolutely no sense. It's pretty ridiculous what you guys are racing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, when we're going down the straights, our propeller, our rudder, and then what we call a skid fin, which is like a side rudder, are the only things in the water. And we're actually running on a cushion of air. Um, but uh, they're pretty spectacular. They're throwing about uh, maybe 150 feet of water behind them in a big rooster tail. And uh, pretty dramatic when you see them live, especially when you see four or five coming around a corner side by side. Dramatic in sight and sound. Um... What's the schedule going to be like for 2024? I know you guys have increased the dates. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, we, we only ran four times last year. Uh, this year, we have six races confirmed, and I believe we'll probably be confirming a seventh one uh, uh, shortly. But uh, we go to Gunnersville, Alabama on June 28th through 30th, uh, Madison, Indiana, which is a historic race we've done over 70 years, uh, July 5th through the 7th. Um, Tri-Cities, Washington, Pasco, Kennewick, uh, Richland is July 26th through 28th. Uh, Seattle, Washington is August uh, 2nd through 4th. Detroit is August 23rd through 25th. Uh, and San Diego would be September 13th through the 15th. And they're weekend events. And like some of these, we take over the town for the weekend. There'll be a parade. There'll be a concert. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty big event for some of these towns. I think uh, Seattle uh, will have two or 300,000 people uh, in the crowd. So it's a big event up there. Yeah, Seattle is all part of the same Seafair weekend up there that the entire state of Washington gets into, and really the entire Pacific Northwest. Uh, and then you talked about Detroit and San Diego. Those are legendary stops. If people are not familiar with uh, your series, to put that in, say, NASCAR perspective, that's like Daytona, Talladega, and Darlington right there. Yeah, I mean, the the, the Mission Bay one in, in San Diego was actually designed uh, with Bill Muncie, a legendary driver behind it from San Diego. It actually was was created with a hydro, uh, unlimited hydro race in mind. So it was built for that venue, for that race. You talked about building the venue for that race, competing with your boats. 
you really have to think about a lot differently than what Tim was just talking about with F1 power boats. Uh, he can race on rivers and small bays and lakes and a lot of tighter, narrower areas because his boats turn so much quicker. Your boats at 200 miles an hour, you need a lot of room and some pretty heavy runoff, I would assume. Yeah, and Tim's boats will go both directions, I think, and ours only turn left, um, much like a NASCAR car. And uh, we typically run a two and a half mile course uh, with the straights, and we have to have a straight, or we have to have corners big enough to get five boats through them. And, uh, but typically we want two and a half miles. Uh, Seattle goes two miles, but uh, we need a pretty big area and then we need a pit area and our boats have to go into the water via a crane. They can't be launched off the trailer. Um, we travel with two boats and three semi trucks. So there's a lot I mean, when we show up at a town, you know we're there. So uh, yeah, seeing your boats going down the highway is a spe spectacle all to itself. Uh, which, where where do they go about getting those trailers designed and built just for your machines? Yeah, I don't know. Every time uh, the two boats I bought had the trailers with them already, um, so. That's a good question, Ralph. I'm not sure where you get them. <laughs> Usually they come with the boat. I was going to say, I mean, you know, I know as a, as a former boat owner, if I go to my local boat dealer, I get some sort of trailer with my boat just to take it to the ramp, right? But yours are a little bit different. Yeah, they're... You know, they, I truck to pull that one. They ride up on a tilt, and they ride at a certain angle so they're not too wide. Uh, for a lane of a highway, but they're still low enough they can get under underpasses. So, but you're right. I mean, you look at other race uh, cars, they're inside an enclosed trailer. We'll have a semi pulling uh, a boat on the tilt. And um, yeah, you'll get two or three going down the highway together. It'll stop traffic. And uh, people will, will actually start texting and emailing and Facebook of where they're at when we when we go cross country, it it creates a scene with the fans. Yeah, for those of us of a certain age, we grew up watching race cars being towed behind in an open trailer, and that was always something that got you really excited. So it's thrilling to see your boats going down the highway because you're right, it really does stop traffic and everybody's looking out the window and pointing and trying to get to their phone to take a picture. Yeah, we tell sponsors, I said, you've got 15,000 miles of a pretty spectacular billboard running down the highway that you probably get more exposure than even the races. Oh, certainly, certainly. When you look at uh, the venues where you go racing, where what do you need to put your event on? We, have, we uh, travel with a safety crew, with a safety sled. We travel with the pylons. Um, we travel with media people and uh, our officials. We have a start finish gear. We have drones in the air. Um, at one time we used to use helicopters, but drones uh, are cheaper and actually better. They can go lower. Um, we have a, a truck that just, just comes with the safety and officials equipment. Um, while we're there, the race site will set up internet for us at a pit area. We need at least two cranes, possibly three. Um, so it's a pretty big uh, event for a lot of these towns. We are the biggest event they do all summer when we come to race. If I wanted to get involved as an H1 Unlimited pilot, because that's really what you're doing, you're flying one of these things. How do I go about doing that? You know, um, most of the time we're pulling drivers from the lower classes. There'd be uh, at least five classes of race boats besides what Tim talked about, uh, racing um, inboards. And uh, usually we'll, we'll pull somebody to this race there, but keep in mind, we might only have uh, 10 to 12 seats available. And some of these guys are great drivers, win multiple national championships at a lower level and never get a chance to ever be in one of these boats. So like, like the drivers I have are in their early 40s, 
they'll probably be on these seats for the next 15, 20 years. So it's really hard. They don't come open very often. Is there a specific training ground that's better to get into unlimited hydro than something else? I think if you're running the Grand Prix, uh, which are the level right below us that are blown alcohol uh, V8s, um, that's probably as close to the experience. But we have five liter, um, which is a, uh, I own a five liter, uh, is a smaller boat with uh, a V8 in it. Um, we, we pull from that class. You'll see that a lot of like my drivers, one of them drives a five liter, another one also drives a one liter and a two and a half liter. So they drive multiple boats all year um, besides the unlimiteds. As I mentioned in your introduction, you are a member of the board of directors for the series. What's the governing body like for H1 Unlimited? Who runs it? Um, H1 Unlimited is is a nonprofit uh, LLC formed in Washington State, and uh, you know a lot of the owners are involved. Other people are involved. Um, it's a sport actually that was very prominent in the eighties and nineties, and then. Uh, most people are familiar with the Budweiser boat and we were on wide world sports where a lot of things, and then it started to um, go down a little bit. And I think COVID we're building back up out of the COVID where we had our season canceled for a year, but uh, the sports definitely on a comeback right now, but we do monthly meetings on our board and we, we kind of self-govern. We are also uh, sanctioned by the American power boat association and uh, um, usually get a three-year sanctioning agreement with them. I know it's Speed Sport One. We televised your 2023 championship this year. And fans can go and watch all the races uh, for free on Speed Sport One. So we're excited about that and looking forward to hopefully doing business with you again in 2024. Just go to speedsport1.com and you can sign up for free to watch all the races in your area. In fact, I believe we have a video to show now what H1 Power Boat Racing or H1 Unlimited Hydroplane Racing looks like. 3,000 horsepower fighter jets on water at speeds of nearly 200 miles per hour, generating massive 300-foot rooster tails. This is Unlimited Hydroplane Racing. Featuring all-out side-by-side racing, flying inches above the water. Its rock star drivers and wily veteran crews have just one goal in mind, hoisting the oldest trophy in all of motorsport, the coveted Gold Cup. Hydroplane racing attracts massive crowds in a festival-like atmosphere. Hydroplane racing creates massive engagement through its extensive digital media, streaming broadcasts, and national television partnerships. Hydroplane Racing's fans support the brands that support the sport. No other motorsport combines the history, technology, spectacle, and festival-like atmosphere of unlimited hydroplane racing. Well, the announcer is fairly familiar to me. <laughs> yeah. And we got a good look at some of the boats going down through the town as they do the parade. You can see the trailers, really unique. I love the inflatable boats for the kids. Those are fantastic. And it shows that that interaction with the community is very high on your list of make sure we do this right every time we come to town. Yeah, if you see this, if you see these boats live, Ralph, you'll never forget it. Uh, it's it's unique, I think, in, in the presentation and all the water flying everywhere. And, and uh, what's great is I think the last year we probably had the uh, the closest racing we had in a long time. We're, we're Boats are deck to deck. What do you uh, attribute that to? Something with the rules or development of the boats? I just think we've got a good group of owners and they put a lot of money into their boats. And uh, we're hoping to pick up, uh, we're working with two to four more boats, see if we can uh, get our numbers up even higher. But 
I think it's more just a good group of owners that have uh, developed good programs. You guys do a regatta style start. For those that maybe don't know what that is, can you explain it? Yeah, all the boats go out five minutes prior to uh, um, the start, and it's a time start, and the clock is ticking down. And there's certain rules. I won't get into the minutia of it, but they're going around there. They're fighting for lanes. And so really half the excitement is before the race even starts. And so these bows are, uh, um, you know, they're fighting for lanes and which lane everybody wants lane one. Sometimes the boat will be set up for a lane three or something, whatever. They have a plan going in. They have radio guys in their ear. They're, they're looking. Uh, they're telling them, hey, we got this boat coming up here. And there's a lot of strategy. And then when the clock hits zero, they have to have timed everything. So they're right at the start line at that point. Can you give us an idea of what, as a team owner, it takes to put a boat in the water? How many people are on your crew? Uh, how much you've got rolling down the highway compared to maybe what some of our viewers and listeners are used to with either a sprint car team or a stock car team, for example? Yeah, we're running about eight crew per boat. And then it seems like we have uh, a few other people. So we travel with about 25 people for two boats. And uh, we run uh, three semis and uh, two boats. Uh, and the extra semi would have uh, four or five engines in it, uh, maybe six different gearboxes. Um, we might travel with 20 different props. Um, We'll have uh, replacement wings, fairings. We'll have replacement uh, cowlings that go over the engines. We'll have everything in there. So if we do get hit or the water, if you get behind a boat and you get in the rooster tail, that will break up um, like the cowling over the engine. So we're traveling with all of that. So we're we're like a traveling circus, really, <laughs> when uh, when you see it. But we're showing up with about 25 people. And those 25 folks, are they all touching the boat? How many are working on the boat on a given weekend? And what are their responsibilities? I think there's maybe 16, uh, 16 to 20 people touching the boat. And then we have tech people. We have a tech truck. So all these boats have GPS in them. And after every heat, you get data on your own boat from a race pack. And you get it from every other boat. So we'll be going in and we'll analyze. And this is a part I wish the fans could actually see because it's, it's a fascinating part of the sport. You'll look at it. Let's say you got third in a heat. You want to know where you got beat on the course. So they'll overlay that with the other data. And you can say, wow, we're four miles an hour coming out of turn two and turn four. And then you might change to a different pitch prop or you might change to a, 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 a lower geared uh, gearbox shorter gears so there's all this strategy when you look at that data between races where you're changing things out and um, you might say hey we we want to fire out of the hole quicker and we know we're going to run out of top speed a little quicker down that straightaway maybe 70 percent down but it's always that that interplay of how fast we got out of the corners versus how fast are we when we end the straight so all of that's going on in one of our trucks, too. Well, that's a lot of activity, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you get to peek into what the other teams are doing. Did I understand that correctly? True, yeah. And I think what's interesting about our sports is it's a series of heats. And so it's not like, say, a NASCAR race where you're making in-race adjustments. Here we'll race. We'll study the data. We might change our setup for the next one. And then the top five or six votes to make the final, and it's a winner-take-all final. So what does a race weekend look like if I'm planning on going to one of your events? What, as a fan, should I plan for? You know, typically uh, they'll be qualifying and testing um, on Fridays. And then Saturday, uh, they'll, they'll probably have testing and qualifying in the morning. In the afternoon, they'll be running uh, – probably at least four heats and uh, four more on Sunday plus the final. And typically, Ralph, we're in with other class of boats. So it's not just us there. Uh, 
um, Tim and I talked, we would love to get our two boats together, our series and, and do events. Um, we'll probably usually have the Grand Prix with us. And a lot of times we'll have the five liter boats also. So, so there's multiple races besides ours. I mean, the goal really is, uh, you know, to have a race every 20 minutes or so um of, of certain of, of a class i mean obviously we can only go out about every hour because we uh we have all that data to look at and and so the key is to to team up with two or three other classes of boats so we can be on the water continuously and then as a fan uh usually at these venue sites am i sitting on the hillside along the the banks of the water or is there grandstands what am i looking at there's a little of all of that. Actually, uh, there are grandstands usually at every place. There's VIP tents. There's uh, just viewing areas. A lot of times there's um, there'll be a park along one waterfront and they're charging admission to get in and people have set up, you know, their little uh, tents right by the uh, um, right by the water. But the viewing's great. Some of the races, uh, the pits on one side and, and the crowd is all on the other side. Uh, there's uh, several race courses like the Tri-Cities where actually it's the perfect width of the Columbia River and we have corporate tents and crowds on both sides. And so uh, um, you'll see a pretty big crowd. The pits are open so people can come and, and tour through the pits and meet the drivers and and uh, everything during the weekend also. Tell me about the famous log boom at Seafair. Yeah, that's... Uh, um, so in Seafair, it's on Lake Washington. So we, the crowd is on one side with the pits and they run probably a mile up the, uh, um, up, up the shoreline. And then on the other side, they, they run a log boom and then boats uh, um, can tie up to it in a, a, just a long line of boats. And I, I've heard the show out there on the boats is actually better than the race sometimes, but I've never had the, uh, luxury of going out there. I'm always busy during a race, but uh, the great thing is right when we came out of COVID, we had maybe 10 boats found that log boom, and now we're back to where it is full, and there, there could be question, 40, uh, boats out there. Got a good question in from Ed, who's tuned in and watching. Post-race, between rounds of competition, each event, how much maintenance is involved? Are you pulling the engines out completely and putting a fresh one in or what do you do? How much, how much lifespan is there to one of these jet engines? Um, it's interesting. You know, we were down when I ran four races last year, we never took uh, our number one engines out of the boats. So we ran the whole season on, on our, our top engines. Um, we can change an engine between boats. It's not too long. We would probably change a gearbox more than we would change an engine. Like I talked about the data and we might say, hey, we need to get faster out of a corner. But what's great about the turbine engines, there's a lot less moving parts and they don't break near as much as the piston boats did. As you look forward to the future of unlimited hydroplane racing, is the turbine engine gonna be the power plant for the future or are you guys already thinking about and looking at something else. Yeah, we've been looking around. I mean, I think uh, they're, they're, there's a lot of pluses and they're very exciting to watch and they're very reliable. And and if you think about it, they're about 650, 700 pounds and you get 3000 horsepower out of them. So they're, they're a great engine, but you know, they're also army surplus. So there's, there's a limited number of them. We still have plenty to race for 10 more years. Uh, but at some point, and, and I think the offshore racing might use the same engine that we do, one of the classes. Um, but, you know, we're always looking uh, at possibly going back to a marine um, V8 or or we've even talked to somebody about looking at uh, um, some kind of a hybrid engine. I, I think we've also looked at biodiesel running the turbines we have now on biodiesel because they'll run on it. They run on, on Jet A uh, diesel racing fuel right now, but we've run it on biodiesel before and that 
possibly would help us to be more of a environmentally friendly sport. Interesting. How many boats do you get per weekend? What's your field usually like? Um, it, it'll be anywhere from six boats to 10 boats. So when we get to the West Coast, most of the boats are based out of Seattle. And so when we get to the West Coast, we'll, we'll see nine or 10 boats at a race site. On East Coast, uh, we've been running six or seven boats. Uh, we run a round robin format. So if uh, we like to get four boats out in every heat and uh, that feels, uh, you get a, you get five boats out there, it gets pretty tight. <laughs> so, yeah. As you look towards the future as the board, what is your goal for H1 Unlimited Hydroplanes? What's the future look like for the sport? I think the partnership we have with Speed Sport One is a big deal. Um, I think it's a sport that's been uh, very important to the to the uh, cities it's in and the the fan base it has, but it's a sport that's fallen off the radar with a lot of people. So I'd like to get it back into media and the, and the, it seems like streaming is the future for sports over network TV. So I like our partnership. I'd like to get up to where we're running eight to ten races, and uh, and we're running twelve boats. How far off do you think that is? Maybe two years. years. Yeah, okay. maybe two years. I mean, we we made big. I mean, we might go from four races to seven races this year, and run ten boats. So we're pretty close. That's moving the needle pretty quick. Uh, Unlimited hydroplane racing, and in fact, boat racing in general, they've always said is one of those sports of kings, right? Where the owner, and I'm pro you probably know this all too well, the owners tend to have to pay a lot of the bills for the sport to participate. And there's not usually a huge purse payout on the back end. You're racing for the glory and the ability to hoist the cup, the gold cup, for example, in your form of racing. How much sponsorship involvement do you have in the sport these days, and how has it improved over since the 80s, for example? I mean, we all saw Budweiser and, you know, oh boy, Alberto and some of the famous brands that were involved in the sport. How many of them are still around and coming back around and sniffing around saying, yeah, we like what you're doing? You know, the, the interest has gone way up, uh, actually, in the last uh, 12 months. I mean, we get close to a million dollars of sponsorship for our team. And uh, um, I mean, when I look at the venue, like take Seattle, if you're if you're sponsoring, uh, let's say you're advertising in the stadium, the football stadium with the Seahawks, the NFL team, you're getting about 700,000 people over a season and typically the same 65,000 every time you come and you race in ours, you're getting 300,000 people and they're all different people. Well, there might be 150 different people out of that 300 over a weekend, and it's a lot less money. You know, it might be 300,000 to sponsor that event versus a million to advertise inside that stadium. So I think as we're starting to get the word out and people are starting to see the racing we do, there's more space between boats. Sometimes a NASCAR would be bunched up. You see the sponsor decals real well. We're really developing our drone coverage. And if you watch, uh, we're start, we'll buy more drones this year, but they've got one where the drone will hover down by the water and the boats will go screaming by in a straightaway that's just unbelievable uh, to see the power and everything of the boats. It probably captures it more than anything else I've seen on camera. So, you know, I think interest is going way up and uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how that, our partnership uh, with Speed Sport One helps that. Well, we look forward to helping prop that for sure. Thank, Pardon the pun. Thank, thank Francine, you, Ralph. I, I, I'm sorry you have to be the timekeeper here. <laughs> and I, I hate to interrupt you. It was a great session, but it's time to move into our next one. Uh, so, Daryl, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, Registering on EPAR Trade is easy. To start, Click on the Join for Free button on the homepage. First, search your company to see if it's already in our database. If you see your company on the list, 
click on it to select it. Then, choose Claim Company if you are one of the decision makers, an owner, marketing person, or main company contact. Or choose Join Company if you are an employee, and press Continue. If you couldn't find your company in our database, select Register a New Company. On the following page, fill out your name, email, phone number, job title, and choose a secure password. If you chose Register a New Company, you'll need to choose your business type. Select Supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose Racing Business if you're looking to source new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose Race Team if you own or are a member of a professional race team. Then, enter your company name. Please provide a website, Facebook page, or LinkedIn if you have one, and choose to either claim or join the company. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Finally, click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. An email will be sent to your inbox. Please confirm your email address and you will be approved shortly. Welcome to ePartrade.